Good morning, Southwest. Let me encourage you to assume whatever posture you'd like to sing uh, this morning with us. If you'd like to stand or sit or, or whatever you might like to do, kneeling, uh, let me encourage you to do that this morning. Uh, we're going to start with the new doxology, so please sing with us. Mm. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the Hi Southwest family, I'm Jerry Burgum. I'm standing here in the Southwest lobby, but it may not look as you remember it. It's filled with donations that you've been bringing to support our, our uh, fundraiser yard sale, which is July 9th through 11th. Uh, it's gonna be in our parking lot and there's still time to drop off donations. So please bring those down if you have some. Normally this uh, fundraiser is to raise, uh, raise money for a teen mission trip in the summer. But this year, Sam had a little bit different plan. Instead of going to Baker City, he had been working with the Church of Christ in Caldwell, Idaho to take our teens there. But unfortunately, due to COVID-19 and uncertainty of being able to go or not, that's been canceled. However, uh, the plan now is to have a local mission outreach trip for a week long service time here in our area. And uh, that's being organized now, and that's gonna be held July 27th through August 1st. Um, our teens will be available to do yard work, light construction, painting, cleanup, and uh, miscellaneous projects like that for uh, people who need it. They've identified one home to do it in our neighborhood and need your help in finding other people, other homes where we could show God's love and reach out to people in that way. It preferably if it's within 10 to 15 minutes of Southwest. Um, 
Also, we need additional adult volunteers for that week, and so if you're available, please contact Sam to offer your help. The goal is for us to focus on people who don't yet have a church home. And so when you're thinking of people who need it, uh, keep that in mind. Um, that's where we can make a difference in showing God's love. It also really fits our, our vision of being known in the community for relevant life and spiritual support. You know, painting a house shows that we care and it also gives us a chance to build the relationship and show people the love of Jesus. The team's also been working on a can and bottle drive and so far have collected about 600 sacks of cans and bottles. Most of that has been don donated by the community rather than members, so that's, that's just uh, a praise to our, our community that they're supporting us in that way. Um, you may ask, if we're not traveling, why do we need funds? Uh, the reason why is the funds will pay for the paint and the supplies that are needed for the, for the work week. Uh, I just ask that you join me in praying for these items, praying that uh, God's kingdom will be built up, that our teens will be encouraged, and that we will have a successful outreach to our community. So look, please join me in praying together. Father, I thank you for the opportunities you put before us to serve others. And we ask that you open our eyes to the several families in our area who especially need our help with their homes. Father, bless our fundraising efforts and give our team energy and passion for their work. Give us additional adults who are willing to serve. Father, we want this congregation to be a light in our community. Give us the spirit and the strength and the wisdom to do that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The God of the heavens, the ancient of days, the God of our fathers, and God of our friends, the Alpha Omega, beginning and end, forever. Your kingdom will stand. We come to bow before you now. We come to lay our lives down. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. Our maker, creator, before time began, Messiah and Savior, Redeemer, Rock of salvation, so faithful and true. So faithful and true. We give all the glory and honor to you. And honor to you. For you alone are worthy of our never-ending love. We will have no other gods be. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand he leads the way. And with each breath I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, 
I know that he will guide me to higher ground. He ever leads me on until someday the last step will be taken. Each step I take just leads me closer home. I trust in God no matter come what may, for life eternal is in his hand. He holds the key that opens up the way that will lead me to the promised land. Each step I take, I know that he will guide me to higher ground. He ever leads me on until someday the last step will be taken. Each step I take just leads me closer home. This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present and where he is, his home. steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope.
Church. Today's scripture reading comes from James 2, 24 and 25. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Hello, Southwest family and friends. So good to be with you once again in this worship hour as uh, we come together, um, not obviously face-to-face or in person like we would like to, but we come together in spirit to worship our Lord, to give him honor and praise. Uh, thank you for allowing us to come into your home today, and, and I pray that the, this worship service would be a source of encouragement to you, a source of spiritual nourishment, and that we are able to worship our God. And I know that he's pleased as we are lifting these songs of praise to him. It's a fragrant aroma, and when he sees that we are united in, in, as a body, um, united in spirit is, is what's most important. So I want to encourage you this morning as much as I can, remember that God is good all the time and all the time God is good remember that he is with us and no matter what's happening right now God is bigger than any obstacle God can see us through this and I pray that sometime in the very near future uh, we'll be able to be together Uh, that's my sincere prayer and I know it is yours too Um, let's begin today as uh, we continue in our study of the book of Joshua so I'd like for you to please open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 2 Uh, or your Bible applications, go there to Joshua chapter 2. As as you're turning there, I want to remind you that certain characters stand head and shoulders above their peers in the biblical narrative, and Joshua is one of those people. And it's not because of his physical stature that causes him to stand out, it's his spiritual character. You see, Joshua stood alone in his day as a protege of, of Moses. And the mantle that Moses passed on to him scarcely uh, caused a ripple because Joshua was, because of his spiritual fortitude, God's man for the hour. Now, as we study chapter 2, we come across another very interesting biblical character. This character is one of the greatest women in the Bible. She is a woman named Rahab. Now, I I don't know many other women in the Bible, uh, with maybe the exception of Sarah or Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is praised more than Rahab. She is, throughout the scriptures, held up as a great woman of God. Now, God even chose Rahab to, generations later, bring his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, into the world. The, The Bible associates Rahab with the Messiah, When we read through the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, uh, we find that Rahab's name is listed there. Now, that's interesting because how many baby girls have you known in your lifetime that were named Rahab? Now, I know a lot of Sarah's and even more Mary's, but I've never met a Rahab. My guess is that you haven't come across a Rahab either. Why not? It just goes to show that we're not as good as God is, as forgetting the past of people. It's like the story of the young teenage girl that was getting ready to go on one of her first dates. Her date shows up at the door, and he had long, stringy hair. He had dirty clothes. He had tattoos all over his body. He had earrings. He had a nose ring. He just really had piercings all over his body and different places. And he had a skull and crossbones bandana on his head. And and as he walked in, he had a scowl on his face. Now, when her mom and dad saw him, they got worried. And so the mom pulled the young lady aside and said, Honey, we're, we're a little worried about your date. And the girl said, why? And the mom said, well, because I'm just afraid that he's not very nice. And the girl responded, Mama, if he wasn't nice, why would the, he then be uh, doing 5,000 hours of community service? You see, we tend to mistrust, stereotype, and even write off people that we don't approve of. But one of the amazing things about God is that we see him in how he loves people, how he values people, and he calls into himself even people of whom nobody approves. You and I have never encountered any human being that does not matter to God. Now, some may question, you mean to tell me that God values a prostitute as much as he does a prophet? Well, let's read chapter 2 
of Joshua to find out where the truth lies. So get your Bible, your Bible app, and let's read Joshua chapter 2 together. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim to go over to the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly, you may catch up to them. But she had taken them to the roof and hidden them under the uh, stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out on, in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies laid down for the night, she went up to the roof and, and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of, of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone, everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God in, is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will, not, that you, that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now, she had said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made a swear will not be binding unless, on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into the house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Verse 21. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, ford, uh, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. I just love the way that those two spies conclude the report to Joshua in verse 24, that last verse. Now, did they believe that God could give them the promised land? Yes, absolutely. Now, how does this compare with the bad report that the 10 unbelieving spies gave Moses back in Numbers chapter 13? I'm impressed by the confidence shown by these spies when they report back to Joshua. The report that they brought back was not a mixed bag of disturbing and fear-filled data. It was a clear picture of complete conquest under the mighty hand of God. Now, I want us to try to imagine what must have been going through the heart of Joshua as this day that he had finally been, <laughs> finally been, that he'd been waiting for. And remember, he had been waiting for this day for 40 long, tedious, wandering years but that day had finally come, the day that he'd been waiting for. You see, 40 years ago, Joshua and Caleb were ready to go into the land. They were ready to claim their inheritance. They were ready to take possession of it. But the people refused to go in because of their unbelief and fear brought, out, uh, brought on by the report of the weak-kneed 
indecisive, vacillating 10 other spies. And because of the lack of faith in the people, Joshua and Caleb had to wait another 40 years before they could finally go in and claim their inheritance. You know, Sir Edward Hillary, the first man to scale Mount Everest, did not make it on his first attempt. When he returned to London, he was given a hero's welcome for his effort, and there was this big banquet in his honor, and all the lords and ladies of England were there. And at that banquet, they had this big blown-up picture of Mount Everest behind him. And when he stood up to speak, he turned around and he faced that picture, and he said, Mount Everest, you have defeated me. But next time, I will defeat you, because you cannot get bigger, but I can. Now, I suppose that Joshua must have felt something like that. He must have been thinking, you know, this time I'm going to conquer. This time I'm going to take possession of what is mine. This time we will follow God's will and we will inherit the promised land. Notice that this time he doesn't give the people the option if they want to take possession of the land or not. I mean, he's had it up to here with 12-man committees. He picks only two spies, and he says, you go as emissaries to spy out the city of Jericho, which was the closest, large, high-walled city lying across the Jordan. And notice a difference. The first time, the spies went in to to check out the land, to check out the fruits of the land, to see if it really was a land flowing with milk and honey, to check out who lived there and just how strong and fortified their cities were. Now, this time, the two spies were not on a fact-finding mission. They were simply getting military information because it was time for war. And so that's what's happening here in Joshua chapter 2. The Israeli army is encamped across the river, and everyone knows that war is about to take place. But I think God had another reason to send the spies into Jericho, and that reason was a harlot named Rahab. You see, when the two spies infiltrated Jericho, their first contact was with Rahab, a beautiful young woman who was a prostitute by profession. And I don't think they ran into her by coincidence. It was a part of God's plan. You see, I believe Jericho represents a a rebellious world against uh, which uh, uh, God's judgment was pending. But Rahab represents all those um, that the the grace of God intends to spare before he sends his judgment. You see, God is like that. Because he is a holy and just God, he must judge sin. But at the same time, he is a merciful and loving God. And if there is just one righteous person, he will save that person before he sends his judgment. And God found someone with faith in Jericho that he wanted to spare. So, it, And I want you to write this down. It wasn't a coincidence. It was providence that those two spies showed up at the door of this lady named Rahab. They showed up at Rahab's door. So, so what was it about this woman that impressed God so much, even though she hasn't seemed to impress us nearly as much? Well, two things jump out of the text that I feel that we need to examine. There, are, there seem to be a couple of questions about Rahab that we need to deal with. So the first question is this. Was she really a harlot? You see, the Bible, the Bible speaks so highly of her, and we're uncomfortable with the idea that the Holy Spirit would speak so highly about a woman who'd been a prostitute, a woman with that kind of a checkered past. And how could God allow her to be a part of the bloodline of the Messiah, his son Jesus? Over the years, some have claimed that, well, you know, that Hebrew word can mean the keeper of an inn, or maybe she just managed a hotel But I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because when we go to the New Testament and and it speaks of Rahab, every time the word is used in the Greek, it is clearly the word for prostitute. Rahab definitely was a harlot. And so I think the point needs to be made here. You see, God doesn't desire to save and use for his purposes only respectable people. You see, we tend to look at some people and just assume because of where they live and how they dress or what they've done, we assume that they wouldn't have any interest in God. Well, the fact is that this prostitute did have an interest in God. And what's even more amazing is that God had an interest in her. 
You know, back in 1995, the mint in Philadelphia cast a wrong die and produced some defective pennies. The words liberty and in God were just a little fuzzy, and so the pennies were flawed. Now, when we think of pennies, we we don't think that they're worth much anyway. So what about flawed pennies? What would they be worth? Well, because the pennies were flawed and because there were just a few of them, if you can find one today, they're worth over $50 each. Now, I think God's a bit like that. The world sees a person with all of their flaws and says, you know, they're just not worth much. But how does God see them? Listen, folks, if God didn't value flawed things, then nobody would be saved. Amen? Yes, Rahab was a prostitute, and yes, God valued her enough to save her. And the second thing that jumps out of the text to me is the question about Rahab's lie. What about Rahab's lie? Well, let's go back to Joshua chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 3 through 6 again. It says, So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. The woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch catch up to them. But she had taken them to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax, She laid out on the roof. Now, the question is this. Are there occasions where the truth lies? Where the truth deceives? Now, this is a hard question to answer uh, for people of integrity. But let me just give you my opinion. The fact is that war often forces people to choose between the lesser of two evils. For instance... Uh, were Betsy and Cory Tin Boone wrong when they deceived their own government and hid Jews from the Nazis who wanted to murder them? And for years, godly men and women would smuggle Bibles into communist countries illegally. Was it wrong for them to do that? Now, on a more personal note, you know, when Denise and I uh, first went to Mexico to serve as missionaries, it was illegal to be a missionary in Mexico. Were we deceiving the Mexican government when they asked us what our purpose was for being in their country? And then I would say, well, we're tourists. Now, I always felt a pang of guilt when I would say that. Was it wrong for us to hide our true reason for being there? Now, the reason we did that is, we, is because we felt that there was a higher calling to bring Christ to Toluca. We felt there is a higher law to teach all men about Christ. Now, as soon as the government set up visa, though, where foreign ministers could come in as as foreign ministers, we had to jump through all the hoops, and we did that, and we paid a a high monetary price to be able to get our visa, but we got our visa, and I felt a lot better about it. But before that time, we were serving there illegally. Deception has long been understood as an important part of military strategy. Now, Now, I know that the Bible clearly condemns lying, But you need to know that nowhere in the scriptures is Rahab ever condemned for her deception. Instead, Rahab is praised for demonstrating her faith. I mean, look at Hebrews chapter 11, 31 with me. This is what it says. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now look with me in James chapter 2. That was part of our scripture reading. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Both of these biblical texts indicate something very important. And that is that Rahab had put her faith in God before the spies had even arrived. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 2 and and read verses 8 and 9. It says, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Skip down to verse 11. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone... Everyone's courage failed because of you, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sign that, uh, you know, in other words, she just believed that what was going to happen in the future 
is because there is a God in heaven, and that God is a God of heaven and on earth. You see, Rahab had already changed her allegiance even before the children of Israel had crossed the Jordan River to enter the land. And because of her faith in a God that she hardly knew about, God took her from a house of shame and literally put her in the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews 11. You see, in Hebrews 11, there is this sort of a honor roll of faith. And so many of God's heroes are in that chapter and men of, and, and women of faith, and she's numbered with that group. Quite an honor. Now, now, because of her formidable faith, she became part of the bloodline of the Messiah. She would be taken as a legitimate wife uh, by Solomon, and then she would have a, a son named Boaz, who later married Ruth. And so Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed, and he had a son named Jesse, who had a son named David. And thus she became the great-great-grandmother of David, Israel's greatest king. Now I think a real key in the story is to, is to take a moment and just ask ourselves, what was it about the faith of this former streetwalker that so impressed God? I'm going to suggest to you today that we can learn a lot from Rahab's faith. Because there's only one way to be saved, and that is to have a faith that God credits as righteous. And Rahab had that kind of faith. And so I want you to notice three things about Rahab's faith that are absolutely critical for all who want to be saved. What are those three things? The first is this, is that she took to heart the truth about God. I mean, her first words to the spies in verse 9 were, I know that the Lord has given this land to you. In other words, her faith was based on propositional truth. She said, I know what happened at the Red Sea. I know what happened to King Og. I know what happened to King Sihon. And so she based her faith on these realities. And long before the two spies met Rahab, the very spirit of the living God had been within the high walls and moved upon the mind and emotions of this woman. In other words, based on the evidence and the Spirit's call, her faith was grounded in the truthfulness of God's intervention in history on behalf of his people. Now, now friends, this is so critical. We need to know why we believe what we believe. You see, our faith is not a superstition. It's not a collection of principles. Our faith is grounded on specific events where God intervened in time and history to do something for his people. You see, there really was a, bo- a baby born of a virgin in a town called Bethlehem. And this baby really did grow up and became a man and performed amazing miracles. And he really did die on the Roman cross. And he really did rise again And he left the tomb three days later. Now, the evidence is so overwhelming uh, for these historical facts. He really did ascend into heaven, and he really is coming back someday. And so these things are not up for debate. We base our faith on the truth that God entered into history and that he did these things to save his people. You see, Rahab's faith was stronger, which is amazing, than all the Israelites who died in the desert, though they had actually, were actually eyewitnesses of the things that she had only heard about. She had determined that Yahweh was God over all the nations and that he could do whatever he promised. And so notice that she spoke of the conquest of the land as if though it had already happened, as if though it, had, it was already an accomplished fact as we read here in the text. In other words, when she, called, when she talked about God, she said, if God says he's going to do something, you may as well tell it like he's already done it. And by the way, her fellow Canaanites had the same exact evidence, and they did not respond like she did. Rahab did not, did not know a lot about God. But let me tell you something about saving faith. Saving faith is going to act on what it does know about God, even though that faith still has a lot to learn. And the second thing that I want you to write down is this. She took a stand against the surrounding culture. You know, in protecting God's messengers, Rahab literally committed an act of treason against her culture. And this act of faith in God, in showing this, she was renouncing everything about her past. She's saying, I don't consider myself a part of Jericho anymore. That's not my people anymore. That's not my citizenship anymore. 
you know, she stood for the unseen over the seen, and she did so at a considerable risk to herself. Now, let me ask you something. Has your faith ever called you to go it alone against the culture? You see, I believe that if we are honestly trying to live by the truth that we read here in this book, in this Bible, if we really believe that God is who he claims to be, that his, this is his word, there are going to be many, many, many times and we're going to have to decide to go against the culture and make our choice, to make our stand. Now the following is a true story that I heard a speaker uh, mention in one of the Pepperdine lectureships. And it happened in the 1970s. There was a, a young man who was a junior at the University of Texas. He was in the pre-med department, and he had to take a course called organic chemistry. Now, some of you may have had to suffer through that course. He, he was, uh, it was the first day of class, and there were over 1,000 people in that class. Now, this class is so hard, and it has one purpose. It's to weed out all the pre-med majors that don't need to be pre-med majors. So a 1,000 started the class, but only 200 of them ended up taking the class final, to give you an idea of how hard it was. So this young man is in, there in that first day of class, and the UT professor who had taught this class for years did what he always did at the beginning of every first day of class. Now this professor was a very committed atheist, and in organic chemistry, he began to study the origin of things and, and, the, and the makeup of things. And he obviously believed that we all evolve from the pre, pre, primeval juice that Darwinism promotes. And he didn't want to go through the whole class having to mess with Christians saying over and over again, you know, I, I don't, that's not what I believe. So he had a way of dealing with them. And he did this every year. He literally said, now some of you have been deluded by the farce called Christianity. Now we're going to settle that right here and now. And so he picked up a 25-ounce glass beaker over his head and he said, how many of you believe that if you pray to your God and I drop this beaker, it won't break? Now the room was silent like it had been the year before and the year before and the year before and the year before. But this young Christian man was determined not to be a coward. So after a pause, he stood up and said, I'll pray. And the professor said, go ahead. So he prayed. I mean, he just really laid it out there. He figured he was already up to his neck, so he, he might as well go all the way. So he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And he said out loud for a thousand students to hear. He said, God, I know that you are the God, you're a God whether the beaker breaks or not. But in order to teach this class and in order to confront the arrogance of this professor, God, would you allow this speaker not to break? And then he said, amen. And the professor just smirked and he dropped that beaker and it landed right on his toe and it rolled across the floor unbroken. And a thousand students stood up and cheered. True story. Let me tell you something. Spiritually speaking, we're living in Jericho we're living in a world that has been judged and condemned by God, and an army of, from heaven is, is across the river waiting for God's signal to come and destroy this world. And we live in a culture where the ruler of this world is no longer our king. So we better be ready to make a stand. To, we better be ready to choose where our allegiance stands. Francis Schaeffer, in his book on Joshua, wrote this. He said, it's just plain stupid of a Christian not to expect Spiritual warfare while he is living in enemy territory. Let me tell you um, how we can endure. We can endure when we have faith that one day God will come and destroy the sinful world. When we believe that there is a judgment day and we believe it as an accomplished fact. Because God said it, we can talk about it as, as it already happened. The third thing that I want you to write down about Rahab's faith is this. She took action to save herself and others. She really believed that God's judgment on Jericho was certain, and she was able to persuade her family to believe too. Now, now that really is impressive to me, because that took a lot of courage. When she told her family, any one of them could have gone and told the king what she had done, and she would have been executed for treason. But their salvation was worth the risk of going public with her faith. 
Rahab was determined to be delivered from the coming judgment and the sign of her trust in God's mercy and kindness was a scarlet cord. Let's look again at verses 17 through 21. It says, the men said to her, this oath you made us to swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on, on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath that you, you, you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Now, this is interesting because when you go back and you read the earliest Christian writings, when, when they comment about this, this happening in Joshua 2, the, the scarlet cord, they always come to the same conclusion. They call it a type of the blood of Jesus. You see, there is a scarlet thread that runs all through the Bible. It goes all the way back to, to Genesis chapter 3 when God had to kill animals to give Adam and Eve close to cover up their shame and their sin. It goes back to the Passover lamb that was slain and the firstborn was delivered as Egypt was destroyed. It goes to all, throughout all the counts of sacrifices at the temple over the years as the people made propitiation for their sins. And it leads us right up to Calvary where the ultimate Lamb of God was slain. There is this scarlet cord that can cover any sin that has ever been committed. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the rich riches of God's grace. Now, let's get to the bottom line. Do we really believe a final judgment is coming? Again, like we saw last week, we read in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to, those who, uh, who, to, to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not believe God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. The question is, do you believe this? How do you plan to be spared if you do? And how do you plan for all the people you love to be spared if you believe that God is coming to judge the world? I'm afraid that way too many people are depending on their niceness to be saved. You know, I'm a pretty nice person. I don't hurt anybody. I don't steal. I don't cheat on my spouse. I, I'm just a good citizen. I, I'm a good person. I'm sure I'm okay. Well, what does the Bible have to say about this? In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Who's the all? And in Romans 3.10 it says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. You see, the truth is that none of us deserve heaven. We have all sinned. We have all fallen way short of God's standard. And we all are in desperate need of God's grace to be saved. And though none of us are worthy... We can all be saved through Christ. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, it says, And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. You see, God is the God of the second chance. And like Rahab, no matter what your background is, he is willing to save those who have faith in him. But it is only through Christ that we can find salvation. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is our scarlet cord that will ensure our salvation. And so when the army of the Lord, when the host of heaven comes, only those protected by the blood of Jesus will be spared. And so let me be clear about this one fact as we close. Jesus stands before all people as either Savior or Judge. You see, Jesus is simply the Greek word for Joshua. Just as Joshua in the Old Testament stood ready to destroy Jericho and at the same time spare those who had faith in God, Jesus stands ready to come and destroy the world and at the same time spare those who have placed their hope in him. 
So he is either going to come as a savior or a judge. But know this for sure, he is going to come. I believe that an invasion is coming soon and that all of us need to choose which side we're on. What side are you on? What are you doing to ensure that those that you love will be spared? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbled because we know that you are God above in heaven and God on earth. And God, we know you are powerful. We believe that your word is true. Father, thank you for the example of Rahab. Thank you because we see her a person that maybe didn't know a lot about you, but had enough faith to trust and had enough faith to be saved. And Father, I know that somebody listening right now maybe feels like Rahab. Maybe they feel like they've had a checkered past. Their background isn't the greatest, and they're ashamed of some of the things they've done. Father, they may not know a lot about you right now, but Father, they have enough faith. Would you reassure them of that? And as they place more trust in you, God, I pray that you would lead them and you would help them to know that no matter what has happened, you are the God of the second chance. You are the God that gives us a new clean slate. You are a God in whom we can trust. And even though we don't know everything, if we do believe in you and just place that trust in you, that you are mighty to save. Father, I pray that you talk to the rest of us who sometimes look down on others and don't see much hope, Lord. Help us not to ever judge, but Father, just to do what you call us to do, to share our faith, to plant the seed. And as we plant the seed, Father, have trust that you will cause the growth. And Father, I just pray that you would help us all to have that sense of urgency where we need to do what we have to do to bring others to Christ. Father, today, those of us that are in you, we just are so thankful. We just praise you because of your mercy and grace and for bringing Jesus into our lives. And that scarlet cord of, of, of his salvation, Father, is what we depend on, is what we put our faith down on. We are so blessed But Father, help us to share it with others, just as Rahab didn't just think about herself, but she actually thought of her family and others, and Father wanted to share salvation for them. Thank you, Father, for this example. Thank you for this example of faith, and that it doesn't matter who you are. If you have faith, that's enough for you, and you can change our lives radically. And Father, help us for this example of your grace and your love. Thank you, Father, for this example of helping us to see the urgency that we have as a church to reach out and give the saving message to those that need it. Father, thank you so much for being loving. I pray your blessings upon all of us, that everyone that's listening to this, this service right now, God, would you touch us? Would you bless us? Would you supply our needs? Would you help us to know, Father, you are in our lives and you want to bless us. Thank you, God. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. I pray that however God may have spoken to you, that you would take to heart the Spirit's call, the Spirit's prompting. Wherever you are, know that God is with you. We so look forward to seeing each other. I hope it's soon. But if it's not, uh, we will see each other in heaven. (laughs) That we can be sure of if the scarlet cord of Jesus' blood is protecting us, and because we have placed our faith in him. God bless you all. Have a great week. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. My soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, when Christ
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Hello, Southwest Church family and other friends. I hope this finds you healthy and doing well. These are challenging times. Please let us know if there's anything that you need, because we're here to help. Even though we're separated by this pandemic, we still have the ability, through technology, to gather together at the first day of the week to remember Christ's death on the cross, his life freely given as payment for our sins, that we might be saved and be part of the family of God. Please join me in giving thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we give thanks for this bread, which for us represents the body of Christ, sacrificed in our place. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare to take the fruit of the vine, I would like to share with you a thought from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and, the, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. I want to start over that part. Can you edit this out? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> As we prepare to share the fruit of the vine, I would like to share with you a thought from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. There are three items to focus on in this reading as we prepare to share the cup, the fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood. And therefore, three blessings that we have as a result of Christ's blood to remember as we partake of this cup. First, we have confidence to come into God's very presence. By the blood of Christ, we are able to enter the most holy place. We have cleansing from a guilty conscience. Our hearts have been sprinkled by the blood of Christ to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And finally, even our bodies are cleansed by the blood of Christ. We are clean. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we share this cup, we know that it is only the blood of Christ that we can live with confidence knowing we are now acceptable to you. As we share this cup, we renew our pledge and our devotion to you. Make us holy and clean. Walk with us and welcome us into your presence. 
we earnestly repent of any and all evil that we have done. And if we are currently engaged in anything that is not fully pleasing to you, please make it obvious, known to us, so that we can repent of it immediately. We want to belong to you, and we want to treasure and respect the sacrifice Christ made for us, and we want to live by the life that is in his blood. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And at this time, I would like to encourage everyone to consider their gift to Southwest. Even though we're apart, not able to meet at the building, the work of Southwest goes on. And if anything, our opportunities to minister have even increased. So I would encourage you to consider what your gift may be. And there are several different ways in which you can give. You can send it through the mail or through the Southwest app or the link on our website at swest.org. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings and gifts that you have given us and the way that you have supported us in our lives and in our ministry. And Father, we just pray that as we give today, that those gifts can spread out throughout the community and across our nation to support those who need your help. And we pray that the hands that administer these funds would do so in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Southwest, we hope that you'll sing this last song with us before we close. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing waters flow. Let the fiery, cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Strong deliverer, be thou still strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Bear me through the swelling current, lead me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises I will ever give. Songs of praise.